or if you have a car, or you've got tinnitus, or you feel nauseated, or you're losing some of your hearing, you've got many ears to see something from. And we have, uh, with Daniel Brown in the Institute, someone who is really at the top of his form in that guy. He was trained originally, he, when I thought at the time, I'm going to be careful with Ian here, was, was one of the best auditory laboratories in the world. That's Johnson's lab in Western Australia. And I got to know a bit then. And he's a rather eccentric guy, but she does the Mosbauer effect work and things like that were really state of the art. Anyway, he, he trained Daniel, who then went off to the major centre in the world, probably, in many years' disease in St. Louis. And that really finished off his capacity to get on top of this particular disease state, which he's certainly going to do here in this institute. He set up his laboratories on level five of uh, building G, the Grand Mind Research Institute in Hunter Valley Street building, and he's expanding those labs to take in uh, a new crop of postdocs and graduate students. So um, just sit back and enjoy this seminar in terms of it giving you an indication of how the BMRI is going to be the center of solutions relating to many instances. <laughs> and therefore we can hear. Thanks very much, Max. Um, well, before I get into uh, explaining what many years disease really is um, and giving uh, an insight into what my research entails, um, I thought I'd just give a little bit more of a, a background um, into how I came to be researching many years disease at the BMRI. Um, basically, uh, this research essentially started out in around 2002, uh, where a group of many years disease sufferers in New South Wales um, got together and formed a group. And they decided to raise funds uh, to support research uh, into many years disease at Sydney University. And uh, the group were able to raise the funds pretty rapidly, which is not all that surprising given that many years disease sufferers have a reputation for being highly driven people um, who are not only desperate for a cure for this disease, but uh, are also um, have a desire to find a, a real understanding of what's going on in their ears to give them the, the symptoms of this disease. Um, and basically by 2007 the group had sufficient funds to support a postdoctoral research fellow. I happened to be finishing my studies at, uh, at the University of Western Australia. I applied for the position and got it. And that's when they sent me over to the, the States to work with uh, Professor Alex Salt, who's an expert um, in a ear physiologist and also has a particular interest in many years. Um, I worked with Alex over in St. Louis for two years and then returned in April of last year. Um, and then was basically given the task of setting up the laboratory and that's when the, the, uh, the Venias Research Group um, and I approached Max and asked if he had any space and he was kind enough to give, some, give us some next door, which is basically where I'm set up. Um, over the course of the year, uh, while I've been developing this laboratory, which is now fully uh, up and running, I'm performing a number of animal experiments, I have uh, done a couple of other collaborative studies with other city university researchers, um, of some of which I'll talk about today. But, um, Basically, uh, moving on, um, the many years. Sean, I'm pressing the buttons, Sean. It sets this up, Sean. That's hilarious. Why do that? Ah, I did the few. Okay, okay. So, um, as Max said, uh, we are looking to expand the research team and the Many Years Research Fund, Inc. Um, do a fantastic job of raising the funds to support my research, which is really handy for me. Um, and we currently have funds for a PhD student and a certain scientist. We're almost at the stage as well to get another postdoc on board. Um, so that's uh, to expand the research team as well as um, the stuff we've got, the research we're doing, um, beyond what I'm currently doing. Um, I should also point out that um, the Many Years Research Fund, Inc. Uh, have str strong collaborations with uh, Many Years Australia, who are the national support body for Many Years Disease around the country. So if any of you know of anyone who has Many Years Disease, um, uh, you want to point them in the right direction, uh, I implore you to point them both to Many Years Australia and to the Many Years Research Fund, Inc., both of which have websites. Um, as for my research and what uh, the sort of things I do, um, basically, uh, I've tried to base my research around performing both human and animal uh, experiments. Um, I, I do a lot of uh, uh, gross electrophysiological uh, measurements in, in humans where I'll take various uh, auditory and vestibular evoked potential uh, recordings um, for, for diagnosing various hearing and balance disorders. 
Uh, in the past, I've done uh, quite a bit of mathematical modeling of uh, neural activity as well to help, to help us get a better understanding of what causes various auditory disorders. But the bulk of my research does involve uh, in vivo electrophysiology in guinea pigs. Now, we use guinea pigs because they have a large hollow space that surrounds their inner ear structures called the bulla. Um, and that makes it basically relatively easy to uh, surgically access the uh, cochlear and vestibular system in the inner ear uh, to get our electrode wires and micropipettes in for various experiments. Um, and for any of those of you who have stuck your head in Max's laboratories next door, um, you'll, you might have come across this funny looking room, which is basically where I'm currently performing my uh, electrophysiological experiments at the moment. Um, as for many of the disease then, um, first off, uh, there are a number of symptoms that, uh, that uh, form or uh, define many years disease. Um, the most prominent of these, or the thing that really characterises this disease, are these random episodes of severe rotational vertigo that can come on at any, at any minute. A sufferer might be walking along the road or might be at work or driving, um, and all of a sudden, within the space of two to three minutes, or in many cases instantaneously, they'll find themselves on the floor and vomiting with the world seemingly spinning around at 100 mile an hour. These attacks will last anywhere from 15 minutes to 24 hours. Um, and to give you some impression for how severe these attacks are, uh, I'm sure most of you have been dizzy at some stage in your lives, either from spinning around too much uh, on the spot as a kid, uh, or possibly from having a few too many drinks at night and then going to lie down in bed. Um, but I doubt the majority of you have been so unbelievably dizzy that you've had to get an ambulance to come and take you to hospital where you've spent the next couple of days um, in, on, in, on a hospital bed. And I think if you can appreciate how dizzy you'd have to be to actually have an ambulance come and pick you up and take you to to hospital, which is, is the case for most uh, early stage many years sufferers, um, I think you appreciate why these people uh, have a reputation for being quite driven to find a, an answer for what's going on in their ears. Along with the uh, rotational vertigo, there's a number of other hearing imbalance disorders that they get. Um, first off is a, a hearing loss, um, which starts out as a low frequency hearing loss, which fluctuates over the course of the day and, and over the course of several days. And it gradually progresses into a more broader frequency hearing loss, which then becomes a permanent hearing loss. They also have uh, tinnitus of various forms, um, including the ringing in the ear type that many of you may have uh, experienced, but they also have, um, uh, quite often have a low frequency roaring tinnitus or various uh, abnormal types of tinnitus, like a buzzing or a ringing or a zapping. Um, they have auditory recruitment and hyperacusis, which is basically where um, seemingly normal sounds um, to normally hearing people will actually be quite distressing to many ear sufferers and that basically stems from their hearing loss. They uh, also have a constant feeling of pressure uh, behind their ears and in their heads, which gives them what they call brain fog, uh, making it very difficult to concentrate throughout the course of the day. And they have all of the comorbidities that come along with having these various symptoms like increased stress levels and uh, clinically significant depression in many cases as well. Now the disease does have a time course. The attacks uh, will tend to cluster in that a sufferer might be free from any attacks and uh, have relatively little symptoms um, for four or five months, and then all of a sudden, in any one given month, they might find themselves having five or six or seven or eight attacks all in one go. Um, the disease tends to come on um, with a time, well, the average age of onset is around the age of 34, although it is certainly a broad bell shaped curve, and I've known a couple of sufferers that uh, have been diagnosed in their early teens. The disease will basically come on and uh, will, the symptoms will get worse and worse over time um, and they'll essentially have these attacks for anywhere between three to ten years after which um, the frequency and severity of the attacks will begin to subside and they basically start to reach what we call the burnout phase of the disease um, where they basically are left with um, a reduced hearing uh, sensitivity and hearing and balance sensitivity from the affected ear. I should also point out that in most cases it's, uh, it, the disease is confined to one ear but uh, quite often, around 20% of cases, the, the disease will actually spread to the other year as well. As for what's causing many years disease, um, I think it's safe to say there are a number of theories. People have been looking at what causes many years disease for the last 150 years, and uh, arguably most researchers would suggest that no one pathology is going to underlie all forms of many years. People have suggested that um, things like a, a viral infection of the eighth nerve or the inner ear epithelia might cause this disease. Um, it could also be caused by an autoimmune response, either from a virus or from foreign particles in the ear as well. Certainly there are familial link, weak familial linkages between many as disease sufferers, and it seems to be more prominent in whites than blacks, suggesting that it could involve a genetic disorder. 
Um, there are certainly morphological changes that occur in many of disease sufferers' ears, but people have also suggested that uh, morphological changes in around the head and neck might actually also cause the disease. Um, given the relationship between various hormones in the body, such as uh, antidiuretics and diuretics, um, and the fact that it's in many cases uh, bilateral, people have suggested that it could be a systemic disorder, and uh, people have also suggested it could even be a central or neural pathology as well. For the purposes of today's talk, though, um, I've tried to uh, characterise or sorry, um, group the main theories into essentially two main subgroups. The first theory is arguably the most commonly accepted theory, and that is that um, the symptoms of many disease result directly from endolymphatic hydrox, which is this abnormal enlargement of the volume of one of the inner ear fluid chambers, somewhat similar to glaucoma of the eye. With this endolymphatic hydrox, which can be seen in postmortem histological sections or in MRI scans, where the volume of the endolymphatic fluid in these sufferers' ears seems to have increased almost eightfold, um, there has come the suggestion that with this uh, increase in volume, there might be an abnormal fluid pressure, which then might go on to displace the pressure sensitive, the displacement sensitive cochlear and vesicular hair cells, which normally transduce sound, movement, and uh, linear accelerations of gravity. It's a nice theory at one level, and certainly there are a couple of things which support the idea that hydrox is associated with abnormal fluid pressure and displacement of the hair cells. Um, and some of those I'll get to in a second. Uh, unfortunately, we do currently lack hardcore evidence to suggest that there is indeed an abnormal fluid pressure with hydrox, and people trying to replicate the, uh, an abnormal fluid pressure in animal models of hydrox have failed to demonstrate any increase in fluid pressure. They've essentially shown that you can have endophatic hydrox, but it doesn't necessarily have to produce an increase in that fluid pressure, and it doesn't seem to be too much of a displacement of the copy of the hair cells. So we still need to harden up that idea. Um, apart from producing an abnormal fluid pressure, hydrox could also, and I think this is what many people miss, hydrox could also go on to produce various um, changes in the inner ear, such as mechanical changes throughout the ear, which change a person's sensitivity to sounds or vibrations, um, or alternatively, Hydrox itself could lead to a change in the ionic compositions of the inner ear fluids, which then goes on to directly affect cochlear and vestibular um, function. On the complete other side of the coin is the theory that endolymphatic hydrox is purely an epiphenomenon of, of the pathology, which is actually directly causing the symptoms of this disease. Things which would line up with this theory, uh, suggesting where many of might be caused by a viral infection of the eighth nerve, which is directly causing the symptoms but, and may or may not result in hydrox, but hydrox is not necessarily <coughs> producing the symptoms of this disease. And things which support that, that theory are uh, findings where uh, there's been a couple of studies where people have shown that you know, a small percentage of people who don't have many disease, somewhere in about 6% of people without many <coughs> disease, um, they can also have endophatic hydrox, but they don't have the symptoms of many disease, which really raises the question of whether or not hydrox is truly responsible for um, the symptoms we see in this, this disorder. Daniel, what normally controls the endolymphatic hydrox? Brilliant question. Uh, we don't know. We don't know. And that's the same with glaucoma. It's one of these things that um, I, I don't think physiologists have a really good feel for exactly how the body uh, can regulates extracellular volume. We know how cells regulate intracellular volume, but as soon as you've got something which has very sensitive cells, such as the eye or the ear, um, that are surrounded by volumes of, in, of extracellular fluid, we really don't have a good understanding of the processes that are involved in, in uh, regulating those fluid volumes. Now, many researchers will actually look at um, the mechanisms that are involved in secreting the fluids or absorbing the fluids, but it's too often I read or basically see people completely missing the, the, um, the understanding you have to have something that senses the volume. I mean, how does, how does the inner ear know? That there's, there seems to be structures that secrete endolymph and absorb endolymph, but nobody's ever found something or even bothered to look for something which senses the volume of endolymph in the first place. So one of the things I want to look at in my future research is basically um, is to work out exactly how endolymph volume is regulate, regulated and also to look for mechanisms that sense volume changes. Um, now in order to discuss how endolymphatic hydrox could uh, produce the symptoms of this disease and how it could affect hearing and balance function, we have to have uh, yet another simple illustration of the inner ear and all the important component parts. And here we essentially have that where, uh, to start off with, you've got the eardrum, which sounds vibrate. Those uh, vibrations are then coupled through the middle ear bone, which is surrounded by air, through to the inner ear fluids. Throughout the inner ear, you've essentially got two fluid-filled chambers. The inner chamber, shown here in blue, is filled with endolymph, which is high in potassium and uh, chloride, but low in sodium. 
And then totally surrounding the end length, um, throughout the inner ear, is this other uh, fluid called perinate, which is shown here in pink. And uh, perinate is high in sodium, but low in potassium and chloride. Um, now, separating the two, the two uh, fluids is a two cell layered epithelial layer, which is essentially a very compliant, um, uh, thin epithelial layer. Down here, you've got the cochlea, which is the hewing organ, which is, uh, general, which is a snail shell structure, but generally uh, tends to get shown as if it's uh, splayed out it's purely for diagrammatic purposes. Um, when we have, uh, throughout the, in the cochlea, you have this trampoline like structure called the basilar membrane, and on the basilar membrane, you've got a cochlear air cells. High frequency sounds will cause a vibration of this trampoline like structure of the basal membrane in the basal regions of the cochlea. Low frequencies cause a vibration of the uh, basal membrane in the more apical regions. Up here, you've got the vestibular system where you've got the utricle and the saccule. And in the utricle and saccule, you've got the structure called the macula. And again, in the macula, you've got uh, hair cells. And overlying these hair cells, you've got a gelatinous mass which has uh, various crystalline ototonia, such that when we tilt our heads or we have a linear acceleration, uh, the inertia of that, of that mass causes the, the stereocilia or hairs, the stereocilia of these uh, hair cells to um, get displaced and that's essentially how we sense gravity and linear accelerations. And then up here we have these semicircular canals of which there's generally three, which shown here is one. And in the semicircular canals you have this structure called the ampulla. And uh, when we rotate our heads, um, in the ampulla you, again you have uh, semicircular canal hair cells which essentially sit on this little bony ridge. And overlying those hair cells, you have this gelatinous mass called the cupula. And when we rotate our, head, rotate our heads, fluid uh, moves throughout the or around the semicircular canals, causing a lateral displacement. That's and a, a shearing motion of the cupula, and that's how we sense rotations or movements. There's your basic uh, physiology of the ear 101. When we have endophatic hydrops, then we see this gross enlargement of the endolymph throughout the entire inner ear. And uh, the theory, as I mentioned before, the theory has basically been that with this increase in volume, uh, quite possibly comes an increase in fluid pressure, which then may go on to displace the copy and vestibular hair cells. And we know that when you displace the copy and vestibular hair cells, you can change their function. It is a nice idea, and uh, there are a couple of things which I'll point out to support this theory. Unfortunately, uh, as I mentioned, there are, we currently lack evidence to support this, the, the finding or the suggestion that there is indeed an abnormal fluid pressure. And it might be the case that the, the membranes that surround the endolymph are sufficiently compliant to purely stretch um, in a completely accommodating for the increase in volume without producing any increase in fluid pressure. Um, one such finding which um, debates the, the question of whether or not there's a fluid pressure um, is an experiment, we've seen experiments where people have done acute injections of endolymph volume in our guinea pig models whilst monitoring uh, cochlear function. Uh, one such study was done by Professor Alex Salt, who I work with in the States, and what essentially what Alec did was to inject uh, mild to moderate volumes of endolymph uh, acutely in a guinea pig, whilst monitoring cochlear hair cell function and cochlear hair cell displacement using various tricks of the trade, uh, which include making measurements of uh, the electrical current that's uh, transduced by the hair cells, as well as measuring uh, various um, echoes in the email, which I'll get onto. But basically what Alec found was that during these injections, not much really changed in terms of cochlear sensitivity. Um, and certainly there, there might have been a 10 to 15 dB hearing loss um, at the region where he was doing the injection, but uh, that's easily uh, within the levels or within the limits that we might see in any normal perfusion of the cochlea, and uh, it did tend to recover quite rapidly as well. And it certainly suggests to us that um, with small to moderate increases in the volume, uh, the membranes that surround the endolymph are sufficiently compliant to to stretch, um, and you won't get much of a, a pressure change, and you won't get much of a, a cochlear hair cell displacement. No one's done this sort of experiment yet, looking at vestibular function, but that's one of the things that I want to try and develop and get onto in the near future. Um, while on animal models of endolymphatic hydrops, then um, there is a classic a, a chronic model of endolymphatic hydrops in animals. And uh, typically, the way this is performed, there's a number of ways to develop a uh, hydrops in an animal model, but the, the most the most typical way to do it is to go in and surgically ablate this little structure here, which is called the endolymphatic sac. Now, we don't quite know exactly the, the role of the endolymphatic sac, but it's thought to be involved in the secretion and absorption of endolymph fluid throughout the inner ear. But what we do know is that when you ablate the sac in guinea pigs, for the first six weeks after the initial ablation, you'll see the volume of endolymph slowly increase, and these animals will develop endolymphatic hydrops. 
But during that uh, the development of the high drops, you won't really see much change in uh, the hearing function. After about uh, one or two months, after, the, uh, after a blade in the stack, you will start to see a low frequency fluctuating hearing loss, which is uh, similar to what we see in many SD sufferers. And you will also start to see abnormal sound evoked responses, which I'll get into in a second, but abnormal sound evoked responses that are similar to what we see in many ears disease sufferers. And uh, this is essentially the basis behind um, monitoring and lymphatic high drops. And um, this is the state of affairs for basically looking at things that could possibly <coughs> cause many ears disease. Now, while these animals do have high drops and they do have a, a characteristic fluctuating hearing loss and they do have abnormal sound evoked responses, I think it's important to note that these animals do not have the attacks of vertigo that we see with many ears disease. So while they're a, a, a chronic model of endothetic high drops, uh, they are not a, a model for many ears disease. And it might be the possibility that uh, guinea pigs have some anatomical uh, or morphological difference between human ears, which allows them to develop um, endothetic high drops without necessarily getting the attacks of vertigo in, that we see in people. But nonetheless, this is the state of affairs for research into high drops and many ears disease. Now, on the basis of uh, these sorts of changes and the abnormal sound of responses we see in guinea pigs, comes the development of the, uh, the standard or the gold standard test for uh, endothetic high drops in humans. Um, like in guinea pigs we have, that have endothetic high drops, we see an abnormal response in humans with endothetic high drops and in many entities sufferers as well. Um, now, the, the, the test that I'm talking about is electrocardiography or echo G. And it's essentially the, uh, the, the standard or the clinical standard for diagnosing high drops. The test involves placing a recording electrode either on or usually through the tympanic membrane onto the wall of the cochlea or onto um, the fluids of the cochlea. And then presenting the uh, person with uh, high frequency tone bursts or an acoustic click to evoke both a uh, whole nerve compound action potential as well as a DC summating potential from the cochlear air cells. Now, I don't want to go into the, the, the details about how the compound action potential and the summating potential are generated, but I will make the statement that we know that the uh, summating potential is related to the position of the basilar membrane throughout the cochlea. That is, uh, we can introduce something like a very low frequency tone to cyclically displace the position of the basilar membrane <coughs> up and down whilst measuring the, uh, the, way, the echo G waveform. And what we see is that during the low frequency, throughout the low frequency tone, you get this cyclic modulation in the amplitude of this maybe potential with relatively little change in the whole nerve response. Based on the relationship between the amplitude of the somatic potential and the position of the basal membrane then, we can infer that in a person with an abnormally large somatic potential, it might be the case that they have an abnormally displaced basal membrane. And that basically the theory for the last 30 years has basically been that with endolymphatic high drops comes an abnormal fluid pressure and a displacement of the basal membrane down towards the tympy, resulting in an increase in the somatic potential. And this test remains the gold standard for diagnosing high drops in people. And it's, it, at one level, um, it's a nice test, and certainly Professor Gibson, who's here today, uses this test routinely to diagnose many ears disease. Um, but it is invasive, and sufferers don't particularly like it, and it's not the sort of test that you can use easily to uh, monitor various treatments. And we do need to develop um, yet more simple tests for diagnosing high drops in people. Um, apart from the abnormal uh, evoked responses, there are a couple of other things that suggest that, that uh, the copy of hair cells may be abnormally displaced with uh, endolymphatic high drops. Um, one of these is this characteristic fluctuating low frequency hearing loss. Now you can only get you don't really really get a low a fluctuating hearing loss from things which aren't causing any permanent damage to the cochlea. And one thing that ties up with a, a fluctuating hearing loss is a displacement of the organ of body or the cochlear hair cells. Now I don't want to go into details of why um, mammals have very sensitive hearing, and then I don't want to go into details about how, what the relation exact relationship between the position of the basal membrane and uh, a person's hearing sensitivity. But essentially, uh, again, we can do something to demonstrate the relationship by um, introducing a low frequency tone to cyclically modulate the position of the basal membrane up and down. And as you do that, uh, and you monitor a person's hearing sensitivity to much higher frequency tone bursts, you can see this uh, change in a person's hearing sensitivity of the order of about 40 dB throughout one cycle of the low frequency tone. If we then match up the pressure in the ear canal with a person's hearing sensitivity to give us the impression of uh, this, the relationship between the, the position of the basal membrane and a person's hearing sensitivity, you essentially get this view that a, a person has 
sensitive hearing when their hair cells are in the normal resting position. But if you uh, increase or decrease the pressure displacing the cochlear hair cells off to the side, you have a resulting hearing loss. Um, and essentially this, this, uh, this relationship and the displacement of the cochlear hair cells producing a, a hearing loss is essentially what's, been what's suggested to be the mechanism behind the fluctuating hearing loss in people where the idea is that you have in, a person has in, in the lymphatic hydrops, which then produces a pressure, causes a displacement of the cochlear hair cells, but the pressure associated with that uh, in the lymphatic hydrops that may then dissipate, allowing the hair cells to return to their normal resting position, wherein a person regains some hearing function. Another mechanism or a test, a measurement that we can uh, use to give us information about the position of the basal membrane in people. Is, uh, the, is, look, is looking at distortion product photoacoustic emissions, or DPOAEs. Now, DPOAEs are a standard clinical measurement, and they essentially involve playing a person two continuous high frequency tones, which then go into the cochlea and uh, cause a slight <coughs> modulation um, of the basal membrane at an overlapping region in the cochlea. And that modulation or, the, or vibration of the basal membrane causes intermodulation distortion products, if you like. Um, well, they essentially results in distortion, which are other, produces other sounds other than the tones you put in. Those distortion products will then be re-emitted from the uh, ear canal, and we can pick up those distortions as echoes with a very sensitive low noise microphone placed in the ear canal. And uh, these are essentially, you, clinicians quite often use the amplitude of these echoes to get a, a feel for how sensitive a person's um, cochlea is to, to various frequency tones. But what I've been using, uh, what I've been trying to develop is a, a mechanism or a way of using the amplitude of these tones to give us a, a, a measurement of where the cochlear hair cells are at rest in people. Um, again, what the test that I've developed, I started developing this test while I was in the States working with Alex Salty, um, and we were developing the test in guinea pigs. I've since um, uh, transferred the test from guinea pig measurements over to humans. And what it essentially involves is, again, introducing something like a low frequency tone to cyclically modulate the basal membrane, resulting in a complex modulation of the uh, DPOAE echoes. And that modulation then results in sideband distortion products, which you can see in the spectrum of the signal from your low noise microphone. And uh, without going into the exact relationship between the amplitude of the distortion products and the, the position of the basal membrane, essentially it's, uh, you end up with this sort of pattern, which is somewhat similar to the fluctuation in a person's hearing sensitivity. Um, and what I've been trying to do is to use this relationship between the, the uh, distortion product modulation um, and the position of the basal membrane to get an impression of where the hair cells are in many SSD sufferers. So over the last six months, I've been testing both normally hearing subjects and uh, many SSD sufferers in uh, Professor Gibson's otology clinic down here in Newtown. And uh, essentially what I've found is this. Um, in normally hearing people, the test works really well. Um, and on average, uh, it suggests that in most normally hearing people, our hair cells are displaced up towards scalar vestibuli. And when I say displaced, um, if I had to give a, 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 a displacement measurement, I would say the hair cells are displaced by somewhere in the order of uh, maybe five nanometers. So you're talking about very small displacements of the cochlear hair cells um, that, that I'm measuring. But on average, uh, normally hearing people's hair cells are displaced up upwards. Um, unfortunately, one of the, the, the <coughs> problems with this test is that in order for it to work, I have to first have distortion products in a, in a person's ear. In a person's ear, people with a profound hearing loss, somewhere in the order of a 40 dB hearing loss, loss, won't be able to generate distortion products. And as such, I'll either I'll either um, get small distortion products which are just above the noise floor, or, or I won't be able to get any distortion product at all and I won't be able to perform the test on these people. Unfortunately, the, ma the majority of <coughs> the people that have come in to see Professor Gibson <coughs> in his neurotology clinic have been late stage spinier sufferers, and they've had, <coughs> they've had a profound hearing loss, and um, quite often what I'm finding is in these people that they, they, they lack sufficient amplitude DPOAEs for me to produce or be able to do my test. Having said that, <coughs> I have managed to get uh, a number of about uh, five or six early stage mini NCC sufferers who have had relatively normal high frequency hearing. Uh, they may have had a low frequency hearing loss, but their high frequencies seem to be okay. And they have had relatively normal amplitude DPOAEs. What I found though was somewhat unexpected. I can't for the life of me modulate those DPOAEs with my low frequency tone. 
Now, the lack of low frequency modulation of this high frequency response is somewhat similar to what has been found in a couple of other studies uh, of investigators who've used low frequencies to modulate subjective hearing in many ear sufferers. And they, said they essentially found the same thing. They couldn't use low frequency tones to modulate high frequency hearing in many ear sufferers. The conclusion that they came to was essentially that uh, they couldn't modulate low the high frequency responses because these people had a low frequency hearing loss. However, to me, that doesn't seem to be quite right because these responses are coming from high frequency hair cells in the more basal regions of the cochlea, where for all intensity purposes, those cochlear hair cells seem to, work, seem to be working just fine. So there's no reason why a low frequency hearing loss should influence the way in which the high, high frequency regions of the cochlea are displaced by a low frequency tone. The only explanation I can come up with as to why I can't use a low frequency tone to modulate the high frequency responses is that there is a change in the mechanical impedance in the cochlea to low frequency tones. Either the low frequency pressures just aren't getting into the ear at all because of some mechanical change in the cochlea, or alternatively, low frequency tones are getting into the ear, but that low frequency pressure energy is actually then being shunted up towards the vestibular system. Now, that might sound somewhat unlikely, but there certainly is the case in a couple of other inner ear disorders that sounds at particularly low frequencies do get displaced up towards the vestibular system. Um, in, the end then, uh, in the end though, I don't quite know exactly why I, I can't get this sort of modulation in a number of these early stage many ear sufferers, but if I can get a number of other subjects like this and I can confirm that this is, is indeed a result um, and I can understand why it's the case, it might be then, I, I might be able to develop this test as an early diagnostic measurement uh, of many ear disease and uh, intellectual hydros. I should say that uh, about two weeks ago, I did manage to get one particular early stage many ears disease sufferer who had normal hearing pretty much across the board, and he had relatively normal DPOAEs, and I was actually able to get low frequency modulation of those DPOAEs. But what I found in this particular guy who did have any lymphatic high drops, as evident in uh, Professor Gibson's electrical graphic uh, recordings, um, what I found in this guy was when I analysed the modulation of his responses, it seemed to be that his, his uh, hair cells were displaced off towards scalar tympani, which is exactly the result that I was looking for when I first started to try to develop this test. And this might actually be the first case indicating to me that there is indeed an abnormal fluid pressure in, in the lymphatic hydrox, which causes a displacement of the basal membrane down towards scalar um, And if I can get another, a couple, maybe one or two more cases like this particular chap, um, I'll certainly be on the money as to uh, developing a, a tool to diagnose many ears disease and help us understand what's going on with many ears disease, certainly in the early stages of it. But um, all of this stuff so far that I've talked about so far is fine. Um, it's, it's, it's all um, grist of the mill, so to speak, and it's helping us understand what's going on, at least in the cochlea, uh, with this disease. But um, in order to, to get an understanding of what's causing many ears disease, I think most researchers would argue you have to get a feel for what's going on during the attacks of vertigo in these people. Now, uh, typically, it's been pretty difficult to take measurements from people's hearing and, uh, and balance sensitivity during an attack of vertigo because uh, essentially they'll be on the floor vomiting and they don't want you sticking things in their ears and uh, making various measurements from them. But with the improvement of technology and the um, development of new measurement techniques, there's come a couple of recent studies which have really shed light um, on our understanding of what's going on in this disease because they've been able to test people during uh, these attacks of vertigo. One such study was done by a uh, colleague of ours uh, who works at Professor Gibson's Sociology Clinic, Selene McNeil. And what Selene was able to do was to give a group of many years, a large group of many years sufferers, this portable audiometric device that allowed them to, which they could then take home and allow them to monitor their hearing sensitivity at a range of different frequencies over the course of the day, over the course of several days. And basically what she found that yes, their hearing fluctuates. What she was also managed to get though, uh, was she managed to get a number of these sufferers to actually monitor their hearing before, during, and after an attack. Which is actually quite a heroic feat, feat if you uh, have ever seen someone having one of these attacks. But what Cellini found was actually uh, quite remarkable, and that was that not much happens to hearing sensitivity during these attacks. Which, and I say that's rem remarkable because I would argue that for many, many years, um, most researchers believe that during an attack of vertigo, a, a, a sufferer's hearing also deteriorated. And certainly there was a lot of anecdotal evidence around that that was the case, but it was all based on hearsay. Um, 
and nobody done a, a proper measurement of a, a sufferer's hearing during the attacks. That, it was, that was until Cellini came along and this, to this day and suggests to us that not much happens to copy sensitivity. Which really begs the question then, why has the bulk of research on intermediate entities focused on the cochlear sensitivity and the cochlear side of things? One of the reasons is that um, it's somewhat easier to make various hearing measurements than it is to make uh, measurements of vestibular function. Um, but another reason why you could argue that uh, is that um, on the whole, cochlear physiology research has been a little bit more advanced than vestibular research. But that's rapidly changing, and vestibular researchers um, have recently developed a number of tests which have helped us to really get an understanding and to get an objective measurement of uh, vestibular function in these people. Before I get onto those sorts of tests and the results in a few of these studies, um, I just wanted to have a bit of a closer look at the, uh, the rotational vertigo that these sufferers get. <clears throat> First off, the, uh, the attacks of vertigo uh, most often are, uh, are purely of a rotational nature. That is, um, the person will be primarily dizzy and the world will be spinning rather than seesawing. Um, now, but that, having said that, there is um, some anecdotal evidence uh, and a couple of small studies that suggest there is a, a positional aspect to the disease as well, but primarily the attacks are of a rotational nature. The nystagmus, which is the flickering of the eye, can tell the uh, vestibular neurologist quite a lot about what's going on in the eating ear. And uh, most often, in about 85% of uh, the attacks, the slow phase of the nystagmus, there's a slow and a quick phase to the eye flickering. The slow phase of the nystagmus is most often directed towards the affected ear, suggesting that there's actually a pariasis or a reduction in the activity from that affected ear. However, in, a, in around 15 to 20% of the attacks, the nystagmus will actually be directed towards the good ear suggesting that there might be actually an increase in the activity from the affected ear. Even more perplexing is that in a smaller number of case, cases, somewhere in the order of 5 to 10 percent of cases or the attacks, the direction of the nystagmus might actually change, direct change, which really sort of begs the word, starts just gives an impression that whatever's going on in this disease is highly complex. It isn't simply just that they've got a reduced um, function of the vestibular system in that affected ear. So there's not purely damage going on, there's something else going on to, uh, with their vestibular systems. Now, uh, as I mentioned, we have to, if we're going to get a, a, appreciate uh, what's going on in these attacks, we have to start looking at uh, testing the vestibular system uh, during, the, during these attacks in these many years sufferers. One uh, such test that has been developed recently that has allowed researchers to uh, get a feel for what's going on in the vestibular system are these ocular vestibular evoked myogenic potentials, or OVEMs. Now, um, these OVEMs are a clinician's dream. They're fantastically easy to get um, as far as uh, gross uh, electrophysiological responses go. Um, you get them by essentially putting uh, electrodes underneath the eyes. And there are a number of ways to stimulate um, these OVEM responses, um, some of which uh, there's still a bit of debate about what, exactly how clinicians should be stimulating these people to, to evoke these responses. But uh, typically the best way to produce these responses seems to be light tapping on the forehead with the person looking up. And that essentially evokes an eye, inferior oblique eye muscle twitch, which is uh, very robust and very large with respect to the noise for and you can get these responses with uh, relatively few averages and get them very rapidly. And uh, the thinking has been that, that uh, essentially the OVEMP response is driven by the contralateral vestibular system. And if you tap on the forehead, it seems to be that it's actually the utricle of the contralateral ear that's actually driving the OVM response. Now, because these OVM responses are really easy to get, um, researchers like um, Professor Ian Kurthoys, who's from the University of Sydney, is here today, um, have been able to get these OVM responses in a number of many of these sufferers um, during an attack. Now, what Ian and some of his colleagues in Italy uh, were able to do was get these OVM responses from many of sufferers during an attack. And what they found was quite remarkable. While we t tend to think of the vestibular sensitivity in many of disease sufferer decreasing uh, over the time course of this disease, what Ian and his colleagues found was that the OVM response during an attack actually increased in amplitude. Now we don't yet fully understand why the OVM response increased in amplitude in these sufferers during an attack, but it does um, demonstrate the importance of actually doing objective measurements of vestibular function during these attacks. And certainly is opening up a, a can of worms as to our understanding of what's going on in these vestibular sufferers' ears. But uh, this is essentially a test of utricular function. 
And what we really want to know is what's going on with semicircular canal function in this disease. Now, <clears throat> the problem with um, with the semicircular canals and uh, many years disease has been the theory if n lymphatic hydrox does indeed underlie the, or the attacks of vertigo in, this, uh, in many years, um, you have to ask the question of exactly how hydrox would affect the semicircular canal function. <coughs> It's easy to understand how uh, utricular hair cell or utricular function or cochlear function might be uh, um, affected by endolymphatic hydrox, given that the utricular and cochlear hair cells rest on a compliant membrane which might be easily displaced down with an abnormal fluid pressure. But in the semicircular canals, the canal hair cells rest on a bony ridge. So any increase in endolymph fluid pressure might cause a, uh, an abnormal fluid pressure either side of the cupula, but that wouldn't necessarily produce a lateral movement of the cupula, which is the, the typical way that the uh, semicircular canals are actually activated. Now, our so over the history, people have always suggested, oh yes, hydrox could be affected, affecting the semicircular canals. But people have re had really limited view into how hydrox could uh, affect canal function. That was until recently, when a, a, a really a couple, a number of really intriguing studies were done by a group of uh, researchers in the States. And what these guys did was to uh, measure the activity of the semicircular canals in toad fish whilst injecting very small volumes of endolymphatic fluid or changing the pressure in the endolymph by very small amounts. And what they found that was, was with picoliter volume injections into the endolymph, they were able to cause a change in the semicircular canal function. And they attributed this change to a bloating of the ampulla with a very small volume increase. And the cupula, which is actually attached to the roof of the ampulla, will actually stretch with this bloating, causing a very complex change in the activity of the semicircular canal afferents. And this essentially gives us a way in which endolymphatic hydrox could produce a change in semicircular canal function. And if, if their results can actually be transferred from toadfish to humans, it actually suggests that very small volume changes, whilst we know that they won't produce any change in cochlear function, will most likely produce a change in the semicircular canal afferents. And that's essentially where my research is, is now headed. And I've now got this new theory that what could be going on in these attacks is a very small volume increase. So essentially, hydrops develops over the course of uh, many months. But uh, there might be actually a rapid increase in, uh, in, in endolymph volume of small amounts. And uh, that small increase in volume doesn't really produce an abnormal fluid pressure because the compliant membranes simply bloat with the uh, increase in volume. But uh, the more compliant the, the membranes that surround the endolymph are, the more the, the cupula will actually stretch. So you can easily begin to see why a volume increase can actually produce a change in canal function, but not necessarily, not necessarily cochlear function. And that's essentially the theory that I'm now trying to test. In order to get a view of this, of whether or not this truly is the case, I'm going to have to do a number of animal studies in which I'm going to have to do uh, acute in, uh, end length injections uh, whilst monitoring both cochlear and vestibular activity. Now, traditionally, people have either, researchers have either been um, purely cochlear researchers or purely vestibular researchers, and very few either uh, tend to cross fields. And, uh, and even fewer would ever try to attempt simultaneous cochlear and vestibular recordings. But given that many years disease affects both systems, um, I'm going to basically try and become the guy who's going to try and make simultaneous measurements from cochlear and vestibular activity. One of the things that's, uh, one of the unique, unique things that I'm going to try and do in this new laboratory here is to apply much of the, or many of the tricks that we've used for years to get a measurement of the hair cell position in the cochlea to the um, to measurement of the vestibular uh, hair cells in the semicircular canals. And I don't yet know if I can actually apply these measurement techniques, but if I can, it will allow me to monitor semicircular canal uh, position during these acute uh, end length volume injections. And if I can do these, if I can, what I'm hoping to find is essentially that if I inject very small amounts of end length volume, I get a very sensitive displacement of the semicircular canal function, um, or the hair cells and change in its function, but very little change in cochlear function. Beyond that, I'm then going to have to start to investigate, as uh, Max asked, the mechanisms that normally regulate the endolymphatic fluid throughout the inner ear. Now, there's been a number of uh, suggestions as to how the inner ear regulates endolymphatic volume. Um, people have suggested that it's entirely up to the endolymphatic sac, uh, which is where endolymph is uh, secreted or um, absorbed, resulting in flow of endolymph throughout the rest of the inner ear. 
Um, Professor Saltenberg worked with in the States, did a number of very complex studies which, where, uh, which essentially involved measuring uh, the flow of the endolymph and what, essentially, what he essentially found was that there doesn't seem to be any endolymph flow, um, and then if that is the case, it doesn't seem the endolymph that exact seems to be involved in regulation of fluid volume, at least not in the normal case. Um, and it's becoming increasingly more um, thought of that the endolymph is actually regulated locally by local epithelia on the lateral walls of the uh, various structures, much in the way that's this very uh, that's a very large positive potential um, called the endolymphatic uh, potential. Uh, is generated. But uh, one of the things, uh, as I mentioned to Max, that um, one of the things I'm going to uh, investigate is actually exactly what mechanisms sense ch a change in volume. That is, you can't simply set up a mechanism which secretes endolymph and another mechanism that absorbs endolymph <coughs> just hope that they actually uh, work um, simultaneously to produce the correct volume. There has to be some mechanism which uh, changes, uh, which, which drives secretion and absorption by sensing a volume change. And they're the sorts of mechanisms that I'm going to base my research around investigating. And essentially, uh, that's where I'll finish. Any questions? That was an excellent presentation. I just wanted to add a bit of information towards your theory because, in fact, um, with my colleague in Italy, Leonardo Manzari, we have not only measured otolith function during attacks, or he has, so it's not me, it's him. Uh, but uh, for the last year he's been measuring semicircular canal function. Yep. Uh, and I have uh, initially didn't believe it. Um, what was he measuring? He was measuring the VOR with our new high-speed video goggles which allow you to pick out the eye movement response during very rapid but very small head rotations, which you can do in patients because these goggles are so light. They're very accurate uh, and uh, they're very lightweight, so he's been able to get this data from people, patients both during quiescence and during attack. And the simple fact is that during attack, that VOR function uh, changes in a very two very interesting ways. The dynamics change, but the gain goes right up. Yes. <laughs> well, you'd yeah, like yeah, that. Yeah. <laughs> so this was uh, essentially. Um, well, this is the incurred and we worked collaborative on a couple of things and this was... Kept it a secret from me. Yeah, he's been, keeping, he's been keeping this particular study he's been doing secret from me until now. In part because, you know, I think part of the story is you've got to be so suspicious of results like that, that, you know, uh, they're going to be extremely important, I think. But I wanted to add the extra bit about those results because for us, he was also testing these patients during quiescence. He works in a little country town south of Rome and he's got these very dedicated patients who come to him and he tests them both times. And during quiescence also the VOR gain is going, going up. Not as much, but during quiescence. I think that's fascinating. I really do, because that's suggesting that they've got an ongoing phenomenon in their system which is changing the gain. That's why the that rapid is. stuff yeah. is so critical to this understanding. Yeah. And I'm just delighted after all these years to hear somebody recognising that many years disease you really ought to be focusing on the vestibular system rather than the cochlea. In order to sense the volume changes, have you actually or has anyone else recorded from the sensory side of the axon activity? Have you recorded impulse changes? The sensory side of What I'm trying to say is, is there any indication of impulse traffic changes in the nerve? In relationship to changes in pressure? Well, first off, uh, let's see if we can find um, If the nerves are either, the bulk of the nerves are either coming from, or are coming from the hair cells. Yeah. Now, the hair cells themselves are, in the cochlea, they're essentially pressure sensors, yeah. and possibly in the semicircular canals, they're volume sensors. So, what I'm really asking is do you know that you've exhausted the number of sensors in there that have an accurate goal? Well, it could be that, so basically you're, you're suggesting that, you know, are these, are, are the hair cells the actual sensors of volume themselves, and do they somehow feed back onto the mechanisms which secrete or absorb? You know? No, what I'm actually saying is, are there other sensory receptors in there that haven't been identified? Oh, that's... Pre-ended. Yeah, that's, um, no, or no one has identified it yet, but that's one of the things that I really want to look at. And there, there, there is one area which I'm really interested in. Um, down here is called, this, 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 that's the oval window, this is a round window, essentially this is where um, it's a, a, menis a, a membrane meniscus which then uh, on the other side is air, 
there's actually, there's one study was done that actually, um, anatomical histo histo histological study that was actually found very small fibers attached to the round window membrane. And there were neural endings coming from these fibers. And if I was, if I had to bet my bottom dollar on a new way, a, a sensor in the thing that had neural feedback to the mechanisms which um, regulate volume, I would have put my bottom dollar on those those fibers actually sensing a volume increase because a volume increase in volume, unfortunately, they're attached to the area. <coughs> that's the, the difficulty in, in using, describing them as, as the volume sensors. Because if you want to regulate the volume of this structure, not of this fluid, not this fluid. But essentially, uh, having a, a a very compliant meniscus with a membrane with, with fibers attached, which are then attached to, to, to nerves, could actually be the, the sort of sensor that you're looking for. But that's the sort of thing I'm going for. There's other there's other reports that uh, or people have looked at channels along this epithelia, which may actually be stretch sensing channels themselves and colloid transporters. Um, and if that's the case, you know, and, and any bloating of this structure would lead to chloride transport um, into from from endolymph into perilymph, and that might actually end up resulting in local regulation of the uh, volume. But yeah, I, I know what you're saying. I, I, I'm really getting, interested in getting someone to actually have a histological look for those nerve fibers. But mine's not really a histologic, but it's as a functional. That is, is there any impulse traffic which could be related to a continuous increase in the, in the pressure in the endolymph? Um, Has anyone done that? Where you just yeah. you get your you get your syringe in there and you yeah. just increase the pressure all the time. Uh, unfortunately, the biggest thing that's going to change is the um, activity of yeah, the. You have to subtract the. Uh, well, how do you subtract the spontaneous activity? But that's a very large spontaneous well, activity. Well, there's all sorts of things on the frequency spectrum which you want to show. That's true. Yeah. Yeah. I was reading a paper recently about um, migraine vertigo and how that sort of intersects with uh, Meniere's disease. And they were saying that people with Meniere's disease are far more likely to have migraine than, than those in the regular population. I'm wondering if, you know, s some sort of mechanism through, and obviously everyone with Meniere's disease wouldn't have migraine, but is there any interaction there? Or maybe migraine is somehow affecting the vestibular system in these people? Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of people. It's often very difficult to, to differentiate, especially in the early um, stages of disease. Sure, when there's no hearing loss, for example. Yeah, yeah. between migraine and Meniere's. Um, and if we go by the theory that the migraines have been produced by a change in the blood supply in the brainstem, um, it might be that, uh, that some of their migraines are actually uh, caused by changes in blood supply of arteries around the lymphatic sac, and that might be involved in um, uh, changing the regulation or the function of the lymphatic sac, which might be involved in regulating the fluid volume. Um, so it is actually something I was actually just looking at what, you know, what the relationship could be um, just the other day, and it's going to yeah, there, I, I, I would suggest there probably is a strong relationship between migraine uh, caused by um, change in blood supply throughout the, the brain and then also change in blood supply um, of arteries near the vestibular structure as well. Mm -hmm. There was a question off the back of the next very great talk, Daniel. Um, I just had a question, um, just curious about whether there's a noted kind of uh, problem with the translational <coughs> gap between basic research in quadrupeds and then translating it over to bipedal humans. Yeah, um, and certainly uh, I was just waiting for someone to pick up on the statement that you know, how can guinea pigs have high drops but not necessarily develop the, uh, the attacks of vertigo? You know, you can only hand wave and say, oh, maybe they've got morphological differences between humans. Um, from what we know, guinea pigs tend to be a pretty um, good model for human human balance function. There doesn't seem to be too many functional changes. Well, uh, there's certainly morphological differences. Um, humans' cochlea aren't surrounded by air, they're surrounded by hard temporal bone. Um, there's a, a difference in the turns, number of turns of the cochlea between guinea pigs and humans as well. So there certainly are differences in, morph in the morphology. There's also differences in the uh, patency of the various aqueducts between humans and guinea pigs. I mean, in humans, most often the cochlear aqueduct is patent, whereas in guinea pigs it's open. And, uh, yeah, so there certainly are morphological differences between the two, um, but unfortunately we're stuck with researching animals. Then. So is there any research in uh, humans? I mean, that's uh, half of my research is based on trying to measure. Oh, in, um, no, not that I know. No one's testing. People have used cats for for in ear research, but. Uh, 
I think it's basically the yeah. again, it's the quadruped. Yes. <coughs> yeah, no, I, I don't know of anyone who's looking at monkeys. Is there any equivalent to an aura in the vestibular activity? Um, now, I don't typically read about them having uh, aura. Um, I mean, it's obviously something that comes up with various vestibular disorders, but uh, I don't, it doesn't generally get lumped in. Uh, Bill, do they, do they get an aura? Do sufferers get an aura when they have an attack? Uh, well, they, get, uh, they, they can sometimes notice changing tinnitus, fullness in the ear yeah. uh, prior to attacks. And often they sense that something's going to happen sort of a nondescript feeling that their balance isn't as it should be. And this can occur um, prior to attacks, and sometimes that's useful in trying to treat them. Yeah. yeah. I have a question. In, it's been known for many years in human beings that you can remove the sac, and it's been removed in surgery, such as by Hugo Fish in Switzerland. It doesn't make it doesn't seem to make any difference to the endolymphomastasis in human beings even when you remove the sac. Yeah. And then, well, for, for many years, um, ablation of the endolymphatic sac in humans in was actually... You know, in, in guinea pigs, you can ablate the sac and it leads to hydrops. In humans, for many years, treating endolymph, one of the ways that people were treating endolymph, or well, many years disease, was to actually go in and ablate the sac, um, which sort of really begs the question of what this thing is doing. And maybe it's doing different things in guinea pigs and, and humans, but we don't really... I think that realistically the surgical ablation of the sac in humans as a treatment for many years has started to subside and, uh, because it doesn't seem to be that beneficial in uh, reducing the, the number of attacks that person gets. Any further questions? The reason I ask about the aura is because there's a travelling negative wave during the war aura period right across the cortex. So with the micro yeah, which I don't work on. That really seems to trigger the subsequent events that occur after the aura. So, so you say you could maybe measure the, if you're taking one, yeah, measurements of the aura before, and many years suffer before an attack and see if they get the aura, and then you could easily associate well, it. Well, there's a physical, if there was an aura, which I'm not clear on in the review, yeah. in many years disease, but they, then you'd have a chance of actually seeing if there were major physiological changes in aura activity, which can then be reflected in all sorts of things. Thank you. And thanks again.